start off by thanking, thanking you for having me here. And uh, the theme of the conference is creating connections. And that's something that's extremely important to me, uh, something that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, in 2008, when Hillary Clinton was campaigning for the Democratic nomination against Barack Obama, in uh, one of the debates, she turned to him and she said, Sir, you campaign in poetry, but you govern in prose. And I find there's something very disturbing about this way of looking at the world. It's very strict, it's very isolating, and it's very confined. So what I'd like you to do is, tonight I invite you to imagine a different world. One that is built on community, a community, validation, and inclusion. So I thought I'd start off by introducing myself to you, and I think the best way to do that is to give you a little glimpse into my world, the world of extreme endurance. What if I told you you had to train two to five hours, six days a week, spend thousands of dollars, fly halfway across the world, get up at midnight, board a ramshackle old school bus for a two-hour drive into the middle of a sleepy South African village. And you get to do this all for the pleasure of running what is considered to be the hardest foot race on the planet. If you're interested in this, welcome to my world. I'm speaking about the Comrades Marathon. The Comrades Marathon is a 90-kilometer race up and down some of the most unrelenting mountainous terrain in South Africa. I had the pleasure of representing Canada at this race in 2013. The race draws elite runners from around Africa, and in the last few years, quite a few runners from Great Britain, Australia, and now Canada and the United States. Uh, this is a race that goes far beyond the country itself. It has become somewhat of a beacon of national pride within South Africa. The entire 12-hour race is broadcast live on television with an average hourly viewership of over 2 million people. So how did I end up in South Africa? One of my closest friends had recently taken a job as the head of a humanitarian aid organization in Johannesburg, and she was back in Toronto visiting friends and family. She dropped by our house. And she said, JP, why don't you and Marianne come down to South Africa and spend a couple weeks with us? And you know, I immediately dismissed this idea, that's absolutely insane, who's doing that? And that's when she turned to me and she said, JP, if you come to South Africa, you can run comrades. Well, you don't know me yet, but you'll soon discover that I'm a type A personality, I am running obsessed, and I'm a recovering addict. As soon as I heard those words, comrades, there wasn't a bloody chance in hell I was not flying down to South Africa. So, I, what I was supposed to do, I targeted a race in Canada that I could use as a qualifying race, and qualified for it. And as the race got closer and closer, I started to panic. Not for the usual reasons, but for all of these other weird what-ifs that were going in my head. What if I get injured and I can't compete in the race? What if I let down everybody back in Canada who had been rooting for me? Or even worse, here I was planning on taking my wife into South Africa. And South Africa is known for its sexual violence and violence in general. Was I crazy for even contemplating this? And that's when my wife, the voice of reason yet again, she turned to me and she said, we cannot give up an opportunity like this. We have to go. So, we did. <coughs> Both their tickets. But we decided to make it into an epic adventure. So we decided to stop in Dubai for a one-week stopover on our way into South Africa. Let me tell you a little bit about Dubai. If you've never seen it before, just imagine the Jetsons <laughs> with a big dose of Disneyland talk on there. And that's what we buy in. We, it is so hot. 
Imagine turning your oven up to its highest setting, opening the door, and standing in front of it. That's Dubai. It is 40 degrees at 2 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> By far, the funniest part of this trip, and I only say it's funny now two years later. It's taken me two years, and Christine will she'll back me up on this. It's taken me two years to admit that this was actually funny. But Marianne convinced me to take this one-hour adventure drive up and down these sand dunes in South Africa. And after the drive, we were going to finish in a Bedouin tent in the middle of the desert, and we would have a Middle Eastern meal with a little belly dancing under the setting sun in the desert. And it sounds absolutely idyllic, doesn't it? One problem. <coughs> I forgot that I get violently car sick. And I'm talking, I get sick in the back of taxis in downtown Toronto, right? So here we are, the six tourists in the back of this Land Rover, and we're flying breakneck speeds up and down these sand dunes, and within about 10 minutes, I am screaming at the top of my lungs for this driver to stop. He slams on the brakes in the middle of the, uh, of the sand dune. I open my door, and I'm violently sick all over the <laughs> right? My wife is horrified, but the adventure is not over yet. We get back inside this vehicle, and three more times, I'm in it for a couple of minutes, and then, let me out, let me out! Finally, you know, third time, I'm lying on the desert, right? And I, I turned to Marianne, and I said, you know what, please, please leave me here. <laughs> right? I could see the Bedouin tent way off in the distance, and I thought, I'm a runner. I can get myself there. You guys just go on ahead. I'll get there. That's when the driver got out of his car, and he came up to us, and he said, I'm sorry to interrupt, but in 15 minutes, this desert is going to be pitch black. And when that happens, the entire desert floor will be crawling with scorpions. No. <laughs> so this is the point at which my wife, all right, this is the love of my life, the mother of my son, the one person, you'll hear this throughout this story, the one person who has always been there for me in my life. She turned to me and she said, get your goddamn ass back into that truck now. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we did. <laughs> now, a few days later, we arrived in Johannesburg. And, you know, I don't like to do things easy. That's another theme that'll come up. And I arrived two days before this 90 kilometer epic race that I had signed up for. And here I am in a hospital, severely dehydrated. Apparently, running two or three hours a day in 40 degree heat in Dubai was probably not the thing I should have been doing before the Comrade Marathon. So they pumped 15 liters of fluid in me 48 hours before the race. Let me tell you a little bit about this Comrades Marathon. It is unlike anything else we have in North America. As I mentioned, it's a 90 kilometer race, and if you don't know what 90 kilometers is, it's one marathon followed by another marathon, and then add on a whole bunch of kilometers at the end of that, that's a 90 kilometer race. And it's up and down these mountains. There is not a flat part of the entire race, and having been a little bit of time in St. John's, I think you can kind of understand what that will look like. <laughs> so, six hours into this race, my, claw, my quads feel like the wind's me. I am beaten up. I am hurt, but I'm moving. Five kilometers to go, you finally enter the city. And you enter the city, and you approach a cricket stadium. And you do one lap inside the cricket stadium to the finish line. But here's the cruelest part. There's something called a 12-hour cutoff. Yes. Are you ready for this? <laughs> Typically, 18,000 runners sign up for this event. 4,000 elite runners will drop out during the run. 14,000 people left. Of the 14,000, 80% will finish in the last hour of the race. But wait. 
In the last hour of the race, we all wait around for the last minute. With one minute to go, the entire cricket stadium, and it's full, and everybody watching at home, over two million people, start the countdown. 59, 58, 57. At exactly 12 hours, three race officials come onto the field, and they pull this big rope across the finish line. No runner after that point is allowed to cross the finish line. There are hundreds of people who are inside the stadium on the track, hundreds of meters away from the finish line. If you don't cross the finish line, you get no medal. There is no record of you ever having run this race. How beautiful is that? The very last person who manages to get inside under the time limit this is considered the hero of the race. This is the person who is on all the talk shows the next day. <laughs> gets a special medal and a bouquet of yellow flowers. I mean, it's, just, it's insane. So, I'm not really sure when it happened, but there was this magic time when I went from being a jogger into a runner. And, you know, there is no doubt that I think our identity obviously lies within our family and our ethnicity. But I think it's the creative and emotional soul that we get from the tribes that we decide to align ourselves with. And I think it's within these tribes that we seek personal validation, and in some respects, we get a deep sense of protection and comfort that comes from being within a community. If you were to look at a snapshot of my life 18 years ago, you would see a young man ravaged by a very strong addiction. I was a drug and alcohol addict. On top of that, I was in a deep, dark depression. I was diagnosed with manic depression, and I was highly medicated. On top of that, I was suicidal, and my drinking had completely spiraled out of control. At this point, I was drinking a bottle of scotch a day, a lot of drugs on top of that, on top of those drugs, were the prescription drugs, three antidepressants, lithiums, mood anxiety drugs. It was not a pretty picture. There is a very famous researcher in Canada called Gaber Maté, and I'm not sure if you know who this gentleman is, but he works with addicts in Vancouver. And he says something that I strongly identify with. He says, we needn't ask ourselves what is wrong with the addiction, but we need to ask ourselves what is right about the addiction. And when I think about what was right about the addiction for me, it was a way of numbing things. It was a way to keep all of that burning pain that I had inside of me just quiet and away from me. But there's a really sad irony that I and every other addict doesn't realize. There's no such thing in this world as selective numbing when it comes to drugs and alcohol. So yes, the drugs and alcohol were numbing out all of the bad things in my life, but at the same time I had built up a wall that kept all of the love and support I could have had from getting into me. I don't need to bore you with a big, long drunk -a -log, right? I go to enough AA meetings, I've been through enough of those talks to know you don't want to hear that, trust me. But I'll just tell you the end of my drink. My close friend was moving to Calgary for a new job, and we were taking him out to celebrate before he moved away. I was at the bar with a bunch of friends drinking, and one of the ladies who was there with us uh, offered to give me a drive home, because she lived not too far from where I did. She shouldn't have been driving, she was drinking, but that's another talk. I said, you know what, I'm going to stay for one more drink. So I didn't get in the car with her. I got home. Four o'clock in the morning, I got a call. I had to go to the hospital. This lady had gotten into a car accident. She had smashed her car into the back of a propane taxi. The taxi exploded. A plume of fire came rushing through her air vents, melted her pantyhose to her legs, and gave her third degree burns over her face and her entire body. When I visited her in the burn unit that day, I saw myself. And I haven't had a drink or a drug since that day, and a 
two other gentlemen uh, who were uh, training for their first marathon, and they asked me if I'd like to come along and you know train with them. So I did. I sat and we got together every Sunday and we ran for two, three hours at a time and complained about not the running, but how horrible it was being sober and how no one understood them. No. Um, so <coughs> as soon as I met these guys, I realized, you know what? I found my tribe. And for me, I think running is the perfect metaphor for life in general on so many levels. Because all that running asks us to do is to place one foot in front of another and to keep going. But most of all, I believe that running aligns us with a quest. And it's a quest that I think even non-runners would agree have in their lives. There's a beautiful story I like to tell, and it's uh, from the Jewish tradition, and it's from the Talmud. According to this scripture, when we are in our mother's womb, each of us is visited by an angel. And it is this angel who bestows upon us all the infinite knowledge that we need to be successful in this universe. Sadly, just before we are born, the angel touches us just below the nose, and it leaves a little indentation. And that little indentation is called the belt. And it's in this simple touch that all of that knowledge that we had in our mother's womb vanishes. We spend the rest of our life trying to get it back again. And that, for me, is what running is. is trying to get back all of the stuff I need that I used to have. If I look back on my journey as a runner, I can see it has been a quest for sure. When I first came to running, it was, it was definitely an escape. It was a magic aerobic delete button. It was a way for me to push away all the crap that I was feeling inside. However, the more I ran, the more it became about pushing against boundaries, trying to go further, trying to go faster. And what I discovered in doing this was my addictions started to come up again. I had a lot more of that abuse, remorse, Regret, repeat, over and over and over again. But most recently, running to me has become more of a spiritual practice. It's a way of me connecting with myself and quieting my mind. Last year, I ran over 10,000 kilometers, and I know that's more than a lot of people drive in a year. But during that entire time, I never listened to music or anything else. It was just me and my head. And I tell people the best thing about running for three or four hours at a time is that you're alone with your mind. The worst thing about running for three or four hours at a time is that you are alone with your mind. But there's some <coughs> magic point right in the middle of that. There's a <coughs> sweet spot wherein running away from yourself, you are, in a sense, running towards yourself. And for me, that's what running is all about. So let me fast forward this story to right around this time of year two years ago. From the outside, it looked like I had my shit together, right? Here I was. I had a wife and son who loved me dearly. I had been clean and sober for 16 years, and I had a list of athletic accomplishments that left a lot of people in awe, including running, as we said, over 100 marathons and ultra marathons around the world. But there was something inside of me. Part to get part. I'll try not to cry. <coughs> There was something inside of me that wasn't sitting right. I got my wife and my adult son, and I asked them if I could share something with them. And I sat them down and I told them, I am a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. I've been married at that point for 26 years and we never talked about it. A hockey coach had sexually abused me when I was nine years old, and it was a secret that I had been carrying around for most of my life. My wife had no idea what to do with this disclosure, but it turned out she did everything right. She came to the doctor with me the next day. I sat down with my doctor. We said what was going on, and I was directed to this wonderful place in Toronto called The Gatehouse, which specializes in adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. I was also put in touch with Theo Fleury, the ex-NHL player, and he, within me sending an email to him, I got a phone call within 15 minutes. So a few weeks after my intake meeting at that gatehouse, I tried
traveled to Boston to compete in the Boston Marathon. And Marianne knew I was pretty fragile. So, you know, this was the ninth time I had done Boston and she never came before. And she said, I'll come down because I think you need some support. So I did. She, she did came, come down with me. And it was a hard race for me. At one point, I got taken off the course because I was crying so much while I was running. I was hyperventilating. And the medical staff thought, you know, I was having some heart attack or something. So I managed to convince them I was okay. They let me back out on the course and I finished the race. Went back up to the hotel after, had a quick shower, and then Marianne and I went down onto the street to grab a bite to eat before our flight back to Toronto. Within about five minutes of being back on the street, BAM! The first bomb went off. A few seconds later, BAM! The second explosion. I don't need to get into this. You've all seen the news footage. You know exactly what that was like, and you can imagine what it was like being there. So here I was, back in Toronto the day after the Boston bombing. And the PTSD was unbelievable. I was also dealing with the child sexual abuse disclosure process. I decided to take four months off work on a medical leave as a, I'm a teacher. And I registered in that program at the gay house. And part of this program involved a homework assignment called writing a letter to your inner child. Now, we were supposed to find a picture of ourselves taken around the time of the abuse. For me, it was nine years old. And we were supposed to write a letter with this picture sitting beside us, and from the place of being an adult and safe, to reassure this child that at one point, he would get to this place of safety. Now, I know exactly what you're thinking, because you're thinking exactly what the 12 men in my group thought. This is a little crystally. <laughs> this is a little new agey. I don't know if this is going to work. But, you know, I tried it. I sat down with this picture, and I wrote this letter. The next week, the 12 men, we all sat down in our room together, and each of us stood up and read our letter aloud, and the other 12 men passed around the picture of us taken as a child. At the end of that two hours, there was not a dry eye in that room. It was the most transformative experience I had ever had in my life. And I started thinking, you know, maybe I could use this same process to help me heal from what had happened in Boston. So I decided to go back to Boston the following year. But this time, I would run the race twice in the same day. Once to reconnect the discomfort from the year before, and the second time to move that discomfort to a safer, better place. And that's what I did. I started at the finish line in downtown Boston at 5 a.m., and I ran the 42.2 kilometers out to the start. I waited half an hour, and then I turned around with the rest of the athletes, and I ran the 42.2 kilometers back to downtown Boston. In the process, I managed to raise over $25,000 for the treatment center in Toronto that had helped me. But more importantly, through the newspaper, radio, and TV interviews, I did over 100 during that week, raised huge awareness for child sexual abuse. But something else happened along that way. I, I, I became an inadvertent advocate for child sexual abuse. And now I'm traveling across the country speaking about this, and I'm writing about this for Huffington Post. I'm now a featured yes. contributor to Huffington Post, both in Canada and the United States, and I write a lot about addiction, mental health, and child sexual abuse. But I think the most amazing thing to me in this whole experience was my blog. I started this little blog called Breathe Through This. And I did it in the first two months of my treatment program. Just, and for the first little while, it was just family and friends reading this blog. And, you know, let me be honest. At the beginning, it was pretty heavy content. It was pretty deep, deep, dark stuff. But here we are, 18 months later, and my blog now has 425,000 subscribers from around the world. You know what I discovered? The entire experience of coming out of my comfort zone 
smoked some cigarettes I had stolen from my father. While I was in that ravine, I was approached by two men. One of them held me down, and the other one violently raped me. When this was finished, the man who had been holding me down stood up, pulled down his pants, and urinated on me, and walked away and left me in the ravine. You know, this was the secret that lay at the core of all my addiction problems. It lay at the core of every one of my relationship problems. And it wasn't until I was able to move this out of the way would I ever, ever expect to have any way of trusting people again and letting in that love that I knew was there for me. So after the whole Gian Ganeshi scandal broke this fall, I latched on to the, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, the big rape never reported campaign. And I've become an outspoken advocate for survivors of sexual abuse all around the world. Later this fall, I'm going to be running the Toronto Marathon. But I'm not running it once. I'm not running it twice. I'm running it three times in the same day to raise awareness for sexual abuse in our country. You know, I begin thinking that maybe I am resilient. And maybe this was some way my cause that I could champion in the community. But then I started to realize that resiliency was only the first part. It's not where I wanted to get trapped. Because what is resiliency? It's just a matter of you're able to get through crap. Getting through crap is it's definitely a good thing, but it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with growth. And that's when my wife, the love of my life, the person who forced me back into a vehicle that made me nauseous. She said to me, you know what, I found a quote that I think perfectly describes me. She said, the quote reads, resiliency is your ability to bounce back. Resolve, however, is your ability to dig deep, push forward, and face adversity. It comes from a strong sense of inner purpose, drive, and tenacity. And it helps you rise above obstacles and failure." End quote. <coughs> now, I'm here to tell you, no matter who you are, there will come a time when fear will shut you down. It will stop you in your tracks. Through my writing and advocacy work for survivors of sexual abuse, one thing has become abundantly clear to me. The greater your purpose, the less your fear. The bravest people I know are not fearless people. These people instead have found something in themselves that allows them to keep going when everything else in them is screaming, no. I'd like to finish off the evening with a happy story. I think it's the perfect illustration of not only finding your voice, but also finding community. In our increasingly competitive world, where we are all trying to carve out our own little identity, our own little Twitter, social media universe, there is an incredible goal and race to claw our way to the top. But I think in gaining the competitive edge, it may help us to survive but it's through embracing community that we learn how to thrive. As I mentioned earlier, when I had returned from Toronto after the Boston bombings, I had to take four months off on medical leave. At the time, I had absolutely zero, and I mean zero, attention span. I couldn't read, I couldn't watch TV, I couldn't even have a conversation. All I could do was sit down and watch the world go by and leave me behind. I felt very much like Jimmy Stewart in Rear Window. I, every day I would see the same people leave on their way to work and then come back at the end of the day. I saw a lot of dog walkers. My God, there's a lot of dog walkers in our neighborhood. <laughs> and I saw parents taking their children to and from school. But one sunny morning, I was sitting out on our Adirondack chair and a father was taking his daughter to school. As is typically the case when parents take their children to school, the children do everything they can to slow down. They are distracted by everything and anything along the way. So the father decided to speed things up a little bit. He walked on ahead and his daughter trailed behind. And that's when she reached into this little concrete bird bath on the edge of our garden. And she took out a stone. And her father saw this, came running back, started to yell at her. You know, stay out 
of the people's guard is not going to belong to you. And that's when he looked up at me. And he saw me. And I could see he was embarrassed. And his little daughter turned to him and said, But why, Daddy? This is my wishing bowl. Every day, Mommy lets me take a stone out. And I make a wish. Well, they walked on ahead. And at that point, I knew exactly what I was going to do. Those words had resonated with me. I thought they were the most beautiful words I'd ever heard in my life. So I thought, I'd like to make something for this little girl. I was going to get a little wooden sign made and put it beside this bird bath for her. So I got up from my chair and I went down to the basement. You know, I'm a bit of a neat freak, so there's not really any leftover anything in my house. So I managed to find an old, dwarfed, wooden cutting board in our basement. Dusty. Grabbed it and a sharpie marker. And on this little board, I wrote, wishing board. Take a stone out to make a wish. Place a stone in to let go of the problem. And I placed this little board beside the bird bath at the end of the garden. And as I look back on this, my only motivation for doing this was to see the little reaction on this girl's face. But what I didn't expect was the reaction from the community. Within a week, people would walk by our house, they would see that little sign, and they would stop. They would smile. They would bend down, put a stone in, or they would take a stone out. And within about two weeks, this little wishing bowl was literally overflowing with stones from around the neighborhood. <laughs> to this day, over 200 people a day stop at this wishing bowl. And what is most incredible are the groups of teenagers on their way to and from school. And you know, teenagers are usually pretty self-conscious people, but they don't seem to care that their friends are there. They stop and they make a wish. There's an old gentleman who comes by every morning and he grabs a stone on his way out, and at the end of the day, he returns it. And I've had parents come up to me and say that they love the wishing bowl because it reminds them to slow down and to look at the world through the eyes of the child. I think it's a beautiful thing. But by far the most important lesson I've learned is that no matter what has brought you to your knees, making the decision to bend with gentleness and to keep moving forward has repercussions that reverberate far beyond our own life. Because we never know who we are inspiring out there. And the people with the greatest impact on my life have not been those who have something I aspire to, but they are the people who believe in me. As a husband, 